the other thing as a host or a guest, you know, putting on a show, we already talked about the first show in the morning, right, Jason and Jen? We talked about after lunch. But you also have to bring it home with the final presentation, right? The final presentation, day one, is somebody that I have followed. You have probably seen him as well. He does it very low-key, does it in his car. He's got the dice. We know him as the uneducated economist. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Wow, are you guys having a good time tonight? Yeah. Right? Lots of good information. I'm going to be the only one who doesn't talk about real estate. <laughs> All right. So just so I can get an idea of my uh, viewers here or my crowd, who has followed me on my channel? Oh, yeah, quite a few of you. All right. So how many of you, this is the first time you've ever heard of The Uneducated Economist? Oh, not too many. All right, cool. So most of you know who I am. That's awesome. Just to kind of give you an idea, I do not come from a family of money. I don't own businesses. I don't do investments. I'm not that guy. I'm the dude who's down at the lumberyard. That's literally who I am. But I have this incredible obsession for studying the economy. And I tell you, when I started looking into some of the things that I have, I noticed that there are so many misconceptions, so misunderstandings, so many people are watching some of the things that are going on out there and are completely filled with complete garbage. That's all I can say it. So as I started doing my research and I started studying a lot of the economic theories that are out there, I really came across four economic theories that will totally help you out and when you're doing your studies and research. And now when you're thinking about like some of these economic theories, a lot of times when you know you hear stuff about the gold standard should come back, or you hear about the BRICS nations, or you hear about US treasuries failing, and you hear about all these things that are out there that are so scary in this macroeconomics world, a lot of times it's hard to understand what it is that is really taking place out there. Like, what is this, right? So I have some notes here that I'm gonna just make sure I follow them. The four economic theories, the first one that I like to follow is something called Gresham's Law, right? Has anybody ever heard of Gresham's Law, right? Gresham's law is really interesting. The theory behind this one is bad money chases out good, right? Doesn't make sense, does it? Like, why would bad money chase out good money? It makes sense that good money would be in circulation, bad money would be thrown out. But let's put this to the test real quick. I'm a merchant. I have something to sell that you want. I'll accept two forms of currency, gold or dollars. You have both gold and dollars. Which one are you gonna give me? You're gonna give me the dollars, right? I mean, how many would give up the gold? Anybody? Of course not, because gold is the good money. Good money chases out, or I mean, bad money chases out the good. So the good money will get hoarded away, and the bad money will get put into circulation. This is one of the reasons why it is very difficult for a new currency to come into existence, is it has to come in as a good currency, or else nobody would use it, right? I mean, honestly, is a bad money going to come into use? No. It has to be a good money that comes into use. But it doesn't come into use so long as the bad money is still in circulation. So this is really how come it is that it's going to be very difficult for a gold standard to return or even a Bitcoin standard to come back is because it would be a good money literally chasing out a bad. It doesn't work that way. Gresham's law prevents that from taking place. Now, Gresham noticed this from coin clipping, right? So people would clip a little bit of the coin off and it would leave a lesser amount of coin left in circulation. Those coins are the ones that made it into circulation. Debasing coins will also have those moved into circulation where the good coins will be hoarded out. There is no way that a bad currency can take out a good unless you go into Thiers' law. Now, Thiers' law is exactly the opposite of Gresham's law, but it's not like a competition to Gresham's law. It's literally the opposite side of it. Once that bad currency has completely failed, then the good currency can come into use. And we actually seen examples of this in places like Venezuela, where legal tender laws had prevented the dollars from being used within Venezuela, so they were stuck using their own currency, which wasn't very valuable or very useful within their own you know, state. So as they were trying to do their transactions and it was making it difficult, the Venezuelan government released it. They said, okay, we'll allow some dollarization to take place. And boom, the good money came in because the bad money was essentially worthless and business started to really, really started to flourish in Venezuela for a couple of years until the, the good money ran out, 
right? Because you have to have a constant new supply of new money coming in in order for it to work. So there's examples of Gresham's Law and Thiers Law that take place today, even though we do have the legal tender laws that are out there. So understanding it from that position really gives you a much better clarity of what it is that's going to be taking place going into the future if the dollar was to, say, lose its world reserve currency status, right? How is that even possible? Gresham's Law and Thiers Law say that it's going to take a certain process to it. Now, let's think about it from a different, for, different fashion, right? Gold used to be the world currency, but the dollar took over. Does anybody know why? Right? Well, a lot of it had to do with World War II, but the ultimate reason is, is that gold is limited. You only have so much of it out there, and there's a lot of transactions that want to take place. So if you have a limited amount of currency, but you have an unlimited amount of transactions, you have a liquidity issue. Right? So now what ended up happening is the dollar provided the liquidity that the, everybody needed around the world. Right? Now, at first, they wouldn't have been cool with it if it was just the dollar, but it was a dollar that was trading equally to the gold. There was a set amount of gold to a set amount of dollars, and everybody believed this. And it was pretty convenient for everybody as the world's transactions needed the liquidity that the dollar was providing. So everybody begged for it. They loved it, right? So they asked for these dollars in order to do the liquidity trades that they, or to have the liquidity in order to do the trades that they needed to do. And then one day they realized there was far too many dollars out there. And they wanted the gold. And we said no. Right, and we said, that's it, no more, you get dollars. That's how the dollar ended up as the world reserve currency is it literally was taking the place of gold because it was providing the liquidity that everybody needed. They wanted to do transactions and there simply wasn't enough gold to do it. So now, that leads me into Triffin's Dilemma. Anybody here at Triffin's Dilemma? All right, Triffin's Dilemma is how does the United States or the issuer of the world currency, it doesn't necessarily have to be the United States, how do they get that money out to the world, right? It's not an easy thing to do. Like, the United States used to be a manufacturing powerhouse, right? We would produce stuff, put it out there to the world, the world would send us their money. Well, we had the money. How do you get the money out to the rest of the world? You gotta buy their stuff. You gotta be in deficit trade. See, this is how the United States is able to get the dollars out to the rest of the world is that we import more than we export. And this is the dilemma that Triffin had come up with, knowing that if the United States was to do anything outside of a deficit trade, they would not provide the world with the liquidity and we would not have the avail availability to freely spend money. Because that's essentially what it is, is we borrow money into existence and then spend it out there in the rest of the world. And now Triffin noticed this as being the major problem for the United States and that there's no way that they could ever move outside of having a deficit trade and still be, be able to hold on to that world reserve currency status. Um, what else? Oh, and that also, okay, so this leads it into the idea of the BRICS nations, right? So here we have these BRICS nations, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa. They want to form their own, say, economic world system that is outside of the United States idea. Yes, sir. Oh, I need a holder? Sorry about that. Let me get it down here. Here we go. Is that better, guys? Okay, sorry about that. All right. <laughs> Not used to holding the mic. So the BRICS nations, right, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, they want to set up their own world trade. They want to be able to do transactions in their own sovereign currency outside of the United States and don't want to do the dollar, screw the dollar, right? There's a problem with this. How many nations want to use other nations' currencies? None of them. Nobody wants to. There's a perfect example of this that's taken place with Russia and India. Russia needs somebody to buy their oil. They sell it to India. India gives them rupees. Russia sits on a bunch of rupees and now they have no idea what to do with them. No other nation wants them and they either have to sell those rupees out there on the market, which is a, seriously like setting them on fire, right? It would devalue these rupees to just go out there and dump them out there on the market. So now they have to have a place to either invest or buy and there's no other place that wants them except for India, right? So now Russia is stuck either doing deals with India or suffer the consequences of not having anything to do with their money. And this is the problem that most BRICS nations will face when they try to do their own sovereign currency transactions is that eventually just get to a point where it's just not beneficial to them. Everybody wants the dollar, 
right? So the dollar is the world reserve currency and it is going to be very difficult for any nation to develop anything that can replace it because Gresham Law will prevent it from happening. And very few nations out there in the world are gonna be willing to do what the United States is willing to do. Trade deficit and massive debt. You have to provide the world with a trade or have to provide the world with the safe and liquid asset like a US Treasury. And very few nations are gonna be willing to do that for the world in order to buy, provide them with that world reserve currency. So when I think about what it is that the dollar is going to be doing going into the future, the idea of the failure, the idea of the hyperinflation, it has a long ways to go before it can get there. Uh, let's see here. So those were the two economic theories, Gresham's Law and Triffin's Dilemma. The other one I really like to follow is something called the bullwhip effect. Now, the bullwhip effect has more to do with manufacturing and inventory levels in the economy that are not really well seen. It's a very obscured thing. So to explain this simply, when you have disruptions at the retail side of things, what it ends up doing is it starts sending ripples through the rest of the distribution network, through the wholesalers, through the distributors, through all the way up to the manufacturers. And a great example of this bullwhip effect, well, it was great in lumber, but I used this analogy when I saw it happening in plumbing fittings, right? So I work at a hardware store. I sell all kinds of lumber and plumbing fittings and hardware and stuff like that. One of these plumbing fittings is a little rubber coupling with hose clamps on each end. It's meant to join two like odd types of pipe. Very simple product, nothing fancy about it whatsoever. But it comes up in short supply, right? Just like a lot of stuff did. Well, I have customers who are desperately in need of this one small little $10 part in order to finish their project and get paid. They come into the store, they can't find it. Literally $10,000 being held up by a single part. When the part finally does come in, the customer buys them all all of them off my shelf. And I'm like, whoa, bro, I got, a, I got plenty. I can get more, no problem, right? He says, nope, I lost $10,000 or $10,000 was held up. I'm gonna have this part on hand always. I'm buying everything you got. Next customer comes in, realizes the shelf is empty, get more stock in, does the exact same thing. Boom, right? Pulls everything he has, everything I have off the shelf. Now, ultimately, I just sold eight parts when the customers really only wanted two. So you see what happens here? My algorithms that, that, that handle the inventory, and it could be just an individual, but usually it's a computer program that's doing it, recognizes that the shelf is always empty. So we need more. Order more. Instead of ordering four, order eight. Okay? So now I think about it. My store is going through this. The neighbor store is going through this. All the stores are doing this all over the country. And all of a sudden, there's a doubling of orders coming in through the wholesalers, through the distributors, all the way up to the manufacturers. They go into mass production to try and fill this demand, only to find by the time the product gets to the retail side of things, the customers are gone. This is the bullwhip effect. And now this happens throughout all kinds of parts of the, of the economy. I noticed it huge in lumber. Lumber had a huge inventory depletion taking place all throughout 2019. So when 2020 hit in the COVID pandemic and the lockdowns and the shutdowns of the mills, all of a sudden we had a huge spike in demand, right? People were moving out of the cities, moving out to the urban areas. They wanted to build decks and fences and remodel the house because they were gonna be stuck at home. And all of a sudden there's this inelastic demand that just shot up, right? Now, I'm sorry. Elastic demand and then inelastic demand. That was the elastic demand that shot up. The inelastic demand are all the contractors out there who signed deals to build houses and had no other option than to buy the expensive lumber. And this is one of the reasons why we saw lumber drive up as high as it did, is that all the inventory depletion that was taking place throughout 2019 that was enhanced by the COVID pandemic left very little inventory within the system. So when the demand started coming from the lockdowns and the stimulus checks and all these contractors looking to build homes for these people who were leaving the city and moving out to the urban area, left very little inventory out there and the spikes in prices just went through the roof. Now, very few people could actually see it, but if you were following my channel, you would have seen all throughout 2019, all the stories and talks and inventory depletions, and mill curtailments, and it would have been very easily understood. So looking at the bullwhip effect on 
pretty much anything out there. I mean, we just saw it happen in chicken and pork just recently. These things happen within the economy, but is very rarely recognized as the bullwhip effect. Usually it's blamed on social aspects or politi politics or something of that nature, but it's literally just misunderstandings of where these inventory levels should be throughout the uh, supply chains. So bullwhip effect, Trippin's dilemma, Gresham's law, what else we got? Oh, my favorite, okay. So those who have followed me on my channel heard me talk about Cantillon, the Cantillon effect. This is probably one of the coolest things that you could ever do as far as research into economics is to, is to uh, either download or buy Richard Cantillon's essay on economic theory. This is a, such an old book. This is like 300 years old this dude wrote this thing, but it was one of the very first essays written on economics. What's very cool about this book is there's three chapters in there, the increase and decrease of money to the state. And those three chapters are so, so powerfully informative on what happens when new money comes into a country or into a particular state and what happens to the people and the separation between the poor. It is just incredible. So let me kind of give you a little bit of an idea of what the Cantillon effect is, right? Because a lot of times when you hear about the Cantillon effect, you'll hear new money comes into the system. When that new money comes in, the people who have first access to that money get to spend it at face value. But by the time it gets down to the, lesser, to the, to the end of the line, the people at the very end, they have to suffer with higher prices, but their wages haven't gone up. Right? So this is like the Cantillon effect in a, in a nutshell. But he went so much deeper into the describing what has actually taken place here. And now, it doesn't really matter how the new money comes in, so long as it's new money that's coming in. And Cantillon describes it with a silver mine, which you know is pretty accurate for back in his day. Today, we can just kind of assume it like being US treasuries or debt, right? This is where the new money comes in. It doesn't really matter how or what that new money is, so long as the new money's coming in, it does the same thing just about every single time. The people who have first access to that money, they get to spend it at face value which is really good for them. They enjoy that new money. Everybody else has to suffer with higher prices. But before that happens, the people who have first access to that money, they want to spend that stuff at face value. So what happens when all of a sudden people have new money coming in, right? They're all going to do the same thing, right? If you got new money coming in, what are you going to do? You're going to enjoy nicer clothes. You're going to drive a nicer car. You're going to live in a better house. And you're going to eat two ribeyes, right? I mean, that's just the way it goes when you have new money. That's the dive into luxuries. So what ends up happening with this new money and the people who have first access to that money and they start spending that money and they start to buy more and consuming more, the prices of everything start to move up on this added consumption that has taken place, right? Supply and demand issues. So now as this added consumption starts to take place and the prices begin to move up, the people who have first access to that money, they're like, no, no, no. I don't wanna spend it on higher price goods. I'll buy that foreign production over there, right? So now foreign production starts to compete with the domestic manufacturing. You see what's happening here? So now pretty soon as this new money continues to pour in and that added, or that added consumption that has taken place that's driving the prices up now has ever increasing amounts of foreign production coming in. Does this sound familiar to the United States? Right? Remember back in the 50s and 60s, we were like, you know, considered the manufacturing powerhouse of the world. We produced the world's best stuff and sold it off to them. Right? We started getting all this new money in. What happened to our standard of living? It went up. Remember, we could have one income, raise an entire family, four, you know, two, four kids, whatever, college tuitions, vacations, all that other stuff. One income, right? Can't do it anymore. Why? Because the new money that's come in, it's raised our standard of living, it's made everything more expensive. And then what happened? We started buying the foreign production. What happened to our domestic manufacturing? They left, right? Same thing is gonna happen no matter what and how you look at it or whatever you do. The dive into luxuries is what's driving this problem. And there's no way you can stop it. When people get the new money in, they wanna enjoy the new money. And so as this happens and this new money pours in and it starts driving the prices up, bringing in ever increasing amounts of foreign production, driving out ever increasing amounts of domestic manufacturing, you're having the separation between the rich and the poor take place. You guys recognize that happening today? Right, same thing. Cantillon effect is still in play today. And it's happening through that new money that's coming in through the system through the debt issuance. And this is really a problem because what happens when the new money turns off? Cantillon describes it, poverty and misery. That's right. If we lose that ability to issue out the new money, how do we get new money in? 
We're not manufacturers of the stuff. We buy foreign, and foreign production. It's going to be a very tricky situation to be in. This is one of the reasons why I always encourage people to hold gold and silver as an insurance policy. A lot of people want to look at it as some sort of investment. I don't see it as an investment. It doesn't pay you. It's not like a rental income, right? I mean, you buy this thing, it sits there, and it doesn't do anything, right? The only thing that it's ever really going to do for you is maybe someday sell it off in the future to a higher price, right? That's the greater fool theory. I don't like that. I don't like being the, like, the idea that I'm going to sell it off to the greater fool. Silver did something for me that was much different than an investment or anything else. It gave me security. It gave me an insurance policy. See, there was a time in my life I was really bad shape. I had no car. I was drinking a lot. I was deep in debt. And my car broke down. And I lived way out away from work. We don't have bus service. I need a car. I call up my buddy, and I'm like, bro, do you still have that Tahoe for sale? He says, yeah, I do. I was like, you trade silver for it? Oh, you know it. You bring it up here? I said, I'll see you in a few minutes. I pulled out 165 ounces. He signed the title over to me. <sighs> I will never be without silver again. Never. That moment right there saved me. I was able to get back to work. I was able to start moving again. I was able to start getting my bills paid off and stuff. Literally, it was from that silver purchase that I had made all those years ago and traded it for Tahoe, and it saved me. I will always have silver as an insurance policy. Never has it ever saved me from inflation. Not one time. So I'm not trying to knock silver as an, or as an inflation hedge. It should work as an inflation hedge. It just never has for me, personally. But it has done a great job as an insurance policy. So those are the four economic theories. Those four basic economic theories, if you were to study them, internalize them, be able to describe them for yourself, you will, be able to, you will find that as you start moving through life, making your decisions, you will incorporate these into your ideas and you won't be as fearful as the idea of BRICS nations taking over or the dollar failure, or gold coming back as a world reserve currency. Not saying that they can't happen, I'm just saying that it's going to be a long damn road to get there in order for those things to occur. So understanding these economic theories gives you a much better clarity of all those kind of questionable situations that are happening out there. All right. Um, the fifth economic theory. This is my own personal one. This is one that I have kind of developed over the last few years. It started from a Ben Bernanke speech given back in 2002 talking about deflation and how to prevent it from ever occurring here in the United States. This is probably one of the most intriguing speeches you could ever read. So if you guys are looking for some good reading material, take a look at this particular one. It's Again, it's Ben Bernanke's, uh, I think it was November of 2002, he gave that speech, and it was deflation, I think it was titled Deflation and How to Prevent It from Ever Occurring. Very interesting, within this speech, he describes all the tools that are needed to fight off deflation. And all those tools have been deployed during the pandemic in the great financial crisis. All the tools were used to fight deflation that was described in that speech. Now, one of the most important tools that was described in that speech was something that I like to call the credible threat. Now, the credible threat is pretty easily explained if you look at it from the story that he tells within that speech of the guy who invents a gold machine, right? So if you can imagine, a guy invents this gold machine, and with this gold machine, he can produce as much gold at will with very little cost or energy to it. The moment that this information gets out to the public, the price of gold would do what? Boom, crash. Before the guy produces a single ounce of gold, in fact, before he even made the machine, just the credible threat alone that he could do it would be enough to change the market. And that's the credible threat theory in a nutshell. There is good examples of this taking place throughout, like even right now, but during the pandemic, it was a perfectly executed one. Do you guys remember during the pandemic, the special purpose vehicles that the Federal Reserve and the Treasury set up? 13 lending facilities to backstop every single corner of the financial market. If there was a loan to be made, the Federal Reserve was going to be there to buy it, right? Or at least say they would be there to buy it. One of, the, yeah, right? one, of these, one of these special purpose vehicles, which is an entity that's separated from the Fed and the Treasury, we have to remember these things could not exist, 
without the unusual and exigent circumstances. That's their words. The unusual and exigent circumstances gave us the power to provide these special purpose vehicles. Now this entity that is separated from the Fed and the Treasury, it was funded with hundreds of billions of dollars. And then the narrative was blasted all over the media. I was one of them, right? On my YouTube channel saying the Federal Reserve is going to be picking the winners and losers. They set up a special purpose vehicle to buy corporate debt, right? Now, this is something that they cannot do. It is 100% illegal. It's not within their charter. However, the unusual and exigent circumstances does give them the ability to buy these corporate debts. So now, all of a sudden, all this media, me being one of them, right, I admit it, was screaming, the Federal Reserve is picking the winners and losers. They are going to be buying corporate debt. This is absolute, asinine, crazy talk. A few months go by, these corporations are gorging, gorging on incredibly cheap debt, right? The yields on corporate debt falls to the floor, right? Prices of them goes up, and all these corporations are just gorging on this stuff, just taking in as much debt as they can. Turns out, the Federal Reserve didn't buy any. They bought a little bit. They bought a little bit to establish a credible threat, but they had hundreds of billions of dollars, and I think they deployed something like 10 billion, right? It was enough to make, a, to make it noticed. It was enough to establish that credible threat. But all these corporations essentially were able to fund themselves just off of the idea that the Federal Reserve was going to be buying it. The market participants rolled in, right? They came in and bought corporate debt, believing that they were going to be able to front run the Federal Reserve. These corporations were funded during the pandemic by the market itself through a credible threat. It was one of the most incredible stories that hardly anybody knows about. Um, oh, the other one, the current one, right now. We are, we are experiencing it right now within the U.S. Treasury market. Now, how many people are like, you know, super concerned about the U.S. debt, right? Going deep into debt, constantly going into debt. I mean, we're going deeper into debt every day. Well, how do you get out of debt, right? You got to pay your debts off. Well, here's something that I found very interesting. The Treasury General account, this is an account at the Federal Reserve. This is the account that the Treasury uses to pay bills from. Typically, this account would have about half or even less than half of the amount of money that is sitting in it right now. The only other time it ever had this much money sitting in the Treasury General account is when they were doing those stimulus programs during the pandemic. Why is this money there? It doesn't make any sense. They don't typically have this much. They don't need that much in there, but yet here it is. Well, if you go and you just Google this because there's not a lot out there as far as news articles, but if you Google treasury bond buyback, you will see that the treasury is planning a scheduled bond buyback later this year. Now, this seems very like nonchalant when you read about it. Ah, oh, this is a scheduled operation, no big deal. Nothing to see here, just move along. Now, I wrote this down, so I wanted to read this to you. This is a direct quote coming from Josh Frost, who is the, let me see if I got this right, the finance, uh, hold on, the Treasury's Assistant as Secretary to Financial Markets. I don't know what he does, but he works, at the, he works at the Treasury and that's his job. In an interview, he had this to say about the bond buyback. Uh, let me put my glasses on because I can't see. Because I'm old now. Yeah, right. All right. So this is exactly what his quote was. This should improve the willingness of investors and intermediaries to trade and provide liquidity in these securities. All else equal, knowing there is, there is a potential outlet to sell their off-the-run holdings. Does that not sound like a credible threat? See, think about that. Let me read it again just because it makes it so much clearer. Just the idea, right? This should improve the willingness of investors and intermediaries, uh, inter inter she was, intermediaries to trade and provide liquidity in these securities. Not the treasury the market, investors and intermediaries, right? All else equal, knowing there is a potential outlet. 
that the treasury would be there to buy them, just like those special purpose vehicles, right? Here it is. He is saying it straight up. They are planning on using credible threats to support the bond market come a liquidity issue that is supposedly is going to be coming in the next six months to a year. This is when they're scheduling this bond buyback. Now, again, if you were to imagine that the Treasury is stepping up and saying, yo, we are going to be buying this stuff, how encouraged would it be for somebody out there to say, yeah, I'm cool with this because if they're buying it, I could front run it to them. If there is liquidity in the market, there's concern lowers. So the Treasury is there saying, we are providing you with the liquidity that you need. And they probably won't have to buy anything. Just the idea of them being there should be enough to do it. And this is something that we should look for coming into the future because I believe this is the credible threat that's being played right now. Um, all right, how long am I into this? How far have I gone? Let's go 10 more minutes. 10 more minutes, okay. You get questions, you get questions with it. Okay, yeah, I'll, get, I'll have time for questions. But I want to do one more. I just want to give you one more thing before I leave because... I find that this is one more that is just so misunderstood, and it's probably the biggest misunderstanding coming from the Federal Reserve and their monetary policy strategies right now. I know I've overwhelmed you with a lot of stuff, and this is probably going to hit you pretty hard. The Federal Reserve is not, not going for a 2% target inflation rate. It is very important to understand that. Everybody, every mainstream media article, every news broadcast, every economist you listen to, 99.9% .9 of the people out there believe that the Federal Reserve is going for a 2% target. Okay, what this means is, is that when inflation has hit 2%, the Federal Reserve is going to try and maintain 2%. This is what they are saying. If bygones, or in let bygones be bygones, so if the, if the inflation failed to achieve the 2%, they would do whatever was in their power to achieve that 2%. Inflation runs over 2%, they adjust monetary policy to bring it down to 2 It goes under 2 again, they stimulate the economy, bring it back up to 2 This is how they've been operating for, since 2012. Failed miserably. They never once ever achieved the 2% target. They hit it a couple of times, but it was on the way past or down, but never once were they able to consistent, consistently land at a 2% ever. So now they've changed. They changed how they look at this. They no longer go for a 2% in target. They go for a 2% average inflation rate over time. This is probably one of the most confusing things that they have ever said if they aren't already confusing it on their own. Now, Jerome Powell has a great speech, uh, August of 2020. I can't remember the name of the speech, but if you just punch in Powell's speech, August 2020, you'll find it. That speech describes this perfectly. He, said, he says it straight up in there. We are abandoning, like, I don't know if you use the word abandoning, but he says we're no longer going for this 2% target, but now going for this 2% average inflation rate over time, and that they are not going to hold themselves to any mathematical formula to figure this out. Huh. Now, isn't that something, right? No mathematical formula to figure out what average inflation rate is over time. Well, what does that mean? Now, it's this arbitrary to the Fed. Is that what's going on? So now we just sit there and wait for them to say, yeah, we've achieved our 2% average inflation rate over time, but you don't know that because we never gave you a mathematical formula to figure that out? This is literally what they say. Go read that speech. He says it straight up in there. But I know there's more to it than that. So I kept studying. I kept looking in. What is average inflation? What is average inflation rate? I mean, nobody talks about it. There's no YouTubers, no economists, nobody out there. It's just the Federal Reserve. They're the only ones talking about it. All right. Well, let's study the Fed. Let's study the Fed. Let's figure it out. Let's, what's this average inflation rate is? And it was so difficult to try and understand this because they kept talking about it. You know, we have this deviation. It ran under 2% for so long. And now we have to make up for those past deviations. Okay, so how do you do that? How do you figure this thing out? There is no mathematical formula. Hmm. Richmond Fed has a paper, right, talking about average inflation. In this paper, at the very end of it, right, describes where they found the 2% inflation over time. So now, here's the thing. If you were to take inflation that had fallen short of the 2% targets, basically since the great financial crisis, and you incorporate all the inflation that we have experienced today, 
there's somewhere in there, there's an average of 2%. How far back is it? And this is the question that really just kind of blows everybody away when they realize that the mathematical formula isn't necessarily a mathematical formula, but a time, a spot in time in the past. Now think about it like this. If you took the inflation rate today and you look back a year ago, you would never find a time that there was a 2% average. It was well over that. So you go back a few more years, still can't find it. Right? But now you start moving from the high inflation into deviations below the 2% target. And if you go back far enough, you can find a moment in time that there was a 2% average. Right? Now, in that Richmond Fed's uh, paper, it was a little bit older, it was about six months ago that this paper came out. They talked about it being October of 2008 through August of 2023. If you look at that right there, the 2% target was achieved over that 15 years. But it doesn't mean that it's going to be 15 years tomorrow, right? If the inflation continues to run hot, that 15 years is going to start moving ever closer to us. You see, this is how the Federal Reserve is looking at the 2% average inflation rate over time. How close that timeline can get to us. If inflation remains elevated, that 2% is going to move from 15 years to 14 years to 12 years away, so long as inflation stays elevated, making up from the past deviations. You guys following me on this? Because right. <laughs> it took me a while to figure this one out, right? Because like I said, there's nobody explaining this. So now if we think about this, 2% average inflation rate over time that has this timeline that is now moving up closer to us because the added inflation that we have experienced today, eventually it reaches a point where it cannot move any closer to us and still have a 2% average. It'll start moving up the average rate, right? There's no time between here and there. That's 2%. That's the inflection point. If they were to continue to have inflation running elevated, that 2% would then go up above 2% and they would have to start moving back out onto the timeline to find the average 2% again. So this is as close as they can get that 2% to the current date before meeting the inflection point and moving up. This is, I know this is complicated, but at the same time, if the Federal Reserve was to have inflation at 2% when this inflection point was met, they could switch to target and move to forward-looking inflation. Up until this point, they're in backward-looking inflation. This is the new system for the monetary policies coming from the Federal Reserve, and nobody sees it. Literally nobody. So now you know it. You can go and research this for yourself. You can look at the San Francisco. You can go and look at Richmond. You can look at Dallas. You can look at all these different Federal Reserve banks out there. All of them are talking about average inflation rate. They're talking about the need for it, the implementing it, and how it is being used today. That 2% target doesn't exist, period. All right, so that's it. Is that? Good, next, great, sounds good. Not, okay. not this one. All right. oh, no. up here. Yeah. <laughs> good <laughs> evening, Yui. <clears throat> Calling a damn good presentation on the die. Thank you. Every time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Ron. So my question is, how do we take this obscure bullshit <laughs> and apply it to our lives? <laughs> Answer me that one. It's the question everybody has. Thank you. All Nighter Hyder. If you're not familiar with All Nighter Hyder, he is the man, right? Everywhere, all the time, the best comment creator on YouTube. How do you, how do you use this stuff? That's a great question because that's really ultimately what it is we need, right? Like, what is it that we do with all this information now that we have it? And this is probably one of the easiest questions for me to answer. You internalize it. You just internalize this information. If you can spit it out the way I just did, then you will have it in your head. You will have it in your heart. You will have it in your thoughts and all your investments and all the business decisions you make and everything that you are doing. You will intuitively be making the right decisions. Here's the thing that I have found. People say, well, what do I do with it? And I'm like, well, now that you have this information, do you see the people out there making mistakes? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, you're not doing that. <laughs> right? You're not doing that. You know, maybe you don't know what to do, but you're not doing that, right? So this is, and this is, this is how it's really helped me in actually just being able to just like go through all this information and keep a clean, cool, collective head, 
right? You know, without filling it with a bunch of garbage and bullshit. If you have these four economic theories plus the you know, plus the credible threat, and then understand what the monetary policy is coming from the Federal Reserve, all this noise that you hear out there, really pretty quiet, you know? So that's my suggestion, is you internalize it to the point that you can say it just as well as I do, and you'll, you'll be good. So I have a question. <laughs> yeah, go for it. How happy are you didn't listen to the Crash Bros and you bought a house in uh, 21? Oh, I was so, so scared to buy a house, guys. <laughs> I was so scared. I mean, interest rates were promising to go up. Housing market was going to absolute crash. I was in a position which I had no other choice but to either leave my town or buy a house. This was the position that I was in. I was so scared. I had bad, bad financial experience in my past. Right? I had some bad financial experience in my past. So I was held to bring up a 10% down. Right, which at the time was every single dollar I have. And what I meant by like every single dollar, when I went down and got the cashier's check for the down payment, I literally had $300 in my checking account. That was it. I was like, it took everything out of me. And I was so scared. I thought, man, I am going to be upside down in this house. It's going to be terrible. I'm not, it's just like every bad scenario that you could ever possibly imagine was ripping through my head, and I did not want to do this. And I went down there, and I handed over that check, and I signed the papers, and I felt terrible about it. And I tell you, I have never been happier with that decision. <laughs> never. I am so glad I did that. And out of all the fear and everything that I was experiencing, Oh, man, I don't know if it was worth it, but I'm glad I did it. Like, I take that all back. I shouldn't have been scared, but I was, and I'm glad I did it. So that was my experience, you know? Thank you, Simon. Yes, sir. Uh, for a wonderful uh, presentation. So my question is, I'm from India, from the BRICS nation, so... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so that was considered a third world country before. Now it's developing. But when I'm seeing this country now, today, I see that's the India I came from. And that's where it's going. I don't like the direction that it's going. So I, I don't like to listen to the economists on the media. They are all paid. I don't trust them. Either they are paid by the media or corporations or politicians. So as an eco economist, they are all wrong. I don't trust them. <laughs> You are the economist. What's your prediction? Are we going worse than where we are? Are we going to improve? Okay. Are you talking about here in America? Huh? Yes. Okay. Here in the United States. Here's the deal, guys. We have already gone too far. Like, there is no reversing the Cantillon effect. And I would say that there is a way of reversing it. If I could find any example of it in history, I can't. Right? So it, it doesn't seem like it's possible. Once the dive into luxuries has begun, there's really no reversing that. The dive into luxuries will eventually start driving out the domestic manufacturing and driving in ever-increasing amounts of foreign production. It is a one-way street. Now, how long they can make it last, I don't know. Like, that part is very open, right? It could last 100 years. If they get into central bank digital currencies and negative interest rates and cashless society, they might be able to continue on for much longer than we had ever imagined. Most of these laws and the ideas behind them were written during a time in which we had fixed currencies. So these laws exist, but they can be masked over. Like, I guess a good way to look at it is if you're flying a plane, right, you can say, yeah, we're, you know, gravity doesn't exist. Well, it does as soon as the fuel runs out, right? You know? <laughs> same thing, right? It's the same thing. Okay, my, yeah, go ahead. Uh, my second question. You talked about liquidity. Mm -hmm. So the banks... The banksters, they lend money when they have deposits, liquidity. So they, they lend to every sector, not just residential, but commercial, industrial, everything. And the feds is going to, they have made an announcement, they are stopping the BN bank term funding program in March 12th. Bank term funding program, sure. Yeah. yeah. So what will happen to the bank that got funding from there? Okay. And what will happen when the commercial loans come due? Because if they are losing liquidity and money from the commercial side of their business, will sure. they stop lending the residential? Okay. 
So I think the, the question here is, is like, where, does the, where did these banks going to get their liquidity if the bank term funding program was to be taken away, right? Because that's pretty much coming to an end. Now, that, that's a really good question because what it seems is, is that once this has gone away, there's nothing there for them, right? But it's not well talked about, but if you go and you read through their documents and their speeches, the Federal Reserve, over, pretty much since, the, since they set up that bank term funding program, has been scrutinizing these banks, right? They now have to have bigger capital buffers. They have to be prepared for more financial stress. They are getting them ready and conditioned for that moment when the bank term funding programs are no longer available to them. Now, this is the part where I don't like to put trust in the Federal Reserve, but this is the thing. They have tools that they do not tell us about, right? I mean, the bank term funding program. Nobody knew about it until the day that it was launched, right? And so this is the thing. The Federal Reserve has lifeboats, and that sucks to think that we are going to be dependent on a lifeboat, but that's essentially what's going to happen. These 150 economists are scrutinizing every bit of the economy and coming up with game plans to deal with situations such as that. And even if we were to go back in history and look at, like, say, Ben Bernanke saying that, you know, the subprime mortgages are isolated or whatever, or it's contained in the subprime mortgages, it wasn't. He knew it. Everybody knew it. The Fed knew it. They had the tools ready to be deployed to deal with the fact that that wasn't isolated, right? But he couldn't come out and say that because it would have just destroyed the market immediately. So the Fed does lie in ways such as Ben Bernanke did that day, but they're not dummies, Right? They got the tools in play or ready to be launched for those type of moments. And I tell you, like, I'm not concerned about keeping my money, my cash in the bank, although I probably should be. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. So you mentioned all of the tools that are being used to um, essentially prevent like the natural economic cycle from taking place, like deflation from happening. Can you talk about how that you think that will impact real estate specifically if all of these tools continue to be deployed and we may like we experience either hyperinflation or um, just. Um, you know, trying to isolate what's going to happen, you know, specifically to like real estate. I don't know. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, right? And it's really hard to predict the future on it. We have a serious issue coming with commercial real estate. How that is going to end up impacting residential real estate, I really don't know. Like, until it actually begins to happen, right? Now, the one thing that I do know is that people are looking at homes one of two ways, right? Either the price is going to go up or down, right? I mean, that's usually, I mean, they have their own reasons why they're buying it, but they're looking at it in two ways. Either it's going to go up or it's going to go down. And so what is it that's going to take for those house prices to come down? And now for me, it's going to have to be inventory, a build of inventory somehow, somewhere, however it happens, whether it comes from a wave of defaults and these houses get foreclosed on and end up on the auctioning block or something. There's got to be a reason for inventory to rise in order for prices to come down. At least that's my opinion on it. There is very few things that I see going on out there in the world that's going to cause a major rise in inventory. Like, I just don't see it. So now when it comes to commercial real estate, there could be a lot of pain felt inside of that. But when it comes to residential, I just don't see where there could be a major move when you consider how many homes are being purchased in cash, how many homes are owned in cash, right? How many of these people are multifamilies living in a home, most likely going to be able to make the payments on it? The conditions that we are in today are so different from they were back in the great financial crisis. And there's people who understand real estate a hell of a lot better than I do who can explain those things a lot better than I can as well. But that's what I see happening is that even if you look at the Cantillon effect of things, the separation between the rich and the poor and the added money that is in the system right now he, ex he describes that as no better way of telling when you have an abundance of the money in the system than to look at leases and rents and property prices. Yeah. So could there be a crash? Sure. I guess. I don't see it. I have two questions. The first question is, in your opinion, it seems like the Federal Reserve was pretty stable with their, uh, their Fed speak, so to say. Last month, change of direction, something spooked him. In your opinion, what do you think 
may have. Can you be more specific at what that was? Uh, yeah, just, I don't know what it was. That's why I was asking your opinion. Like Powell just seemed to really change the direction mm -hmm. um, as far as what like the market was pricing in, as far as rate cuts and all that. It seemed like something really changed the Fed speak, and they had a total change of direction. Like in the past, they were trying to talk the market down, talking about it. Seemed like something really spooked spooked him because the speech changed, and then he yeah. did it. The interview with uh, 60 Minutes, which was kind of out of character. So what do you make of that? Okay. Um, I didn't see any change. Okay. I didn't see any change. Perfect. Not to not to anything that I see that's happening within their monetary policy that I've been studying for the last, yeah. you know, five years to 20 years back. They are very much right on course oh. to where they wanted to be. Um, the, the speaking coming from Jerome Powell, this is a very unique thing. Right? Because he has to be very careful with his words and the way that he chooses them. Because he speaks for the FOMC. Powell makes no ultimate decision. He has one vote. Mm. Right? He has one vote on a group of 12 other people, who, or 11 other people and five alternates. There is the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee. Those are the people who vote on monetary policy. Right? So Jerome Powell, he himself is just literally a spokesperson for the FOMC. Now, the idea came out the other day, a month ago or whatever, that the Fed was going to be lowering interest rates. And it wasn't a matter of if, but when. Like, how many rate cuts are coming, all this other stuff. Like, inflation has reached its 2% target, they've reached their goal or whatever. None of that makes sense to me. None of that made sense to me whatsoever because I understand the monetary policy strategy coming from the average inflation rate over time that has been talked about since even John Williams' speech about how to deal with monetary policy in a low neutral interest rate world, which is another great speech if you ever get the chance to read it. Right? But in that speech, he also described the very situations that we are in today. This is not a surprise to the Fed, nothing, none of it. Right? And so when Jerome Powell comes out, he, these are credible threats. Right? Everything that he says is part of that gold machine operation, right? To make sure that the markets don't think about it. How many people ran out and got a mortgage when they believed that the interest rates were going to go down? Like there was a huge flood, like a, a run on them. People were going out there and getting them, thinking, man, I'm going to be able to refinance into the future, right? But that's not the case today. Now they're wondering if they're even going to lower rates this year, right? See, this is the on off kind of switch that they use in order to stimulate the ideas within the market themselves, right? They could literally sit on their hands and just say that they're going to do stuff and it'll start causing all kinds of stuff to happen within the markets. Recognizing those is vitally important, right? Even in the speech, Jerome Powell, uh, they asked him something like, you're coming down to the 2%. You're going to adjust rates then, right? And he says, no, 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 no. That's not what we're saying at all. What we're going to do is we're going to go for a 2% over time. And that's what he left it. Nobody heard average the average inflation rate over time because they don't know what that average inflation rate is, so they didn't hear over time. All they heard was 2% target. And this is the problem that I think a lot of times, not only the mainstream media, but then just our own understanding of what Fed clouds us from not actually going in to figure out what it is that they are doing and saying. They don't come out and tell you this. They're not going to come out and tell you this monetary policy. They can't. If they did, then it wouldn't work, right? I mean, it literally, you have to go and figure this stuff out for yourself. You have to read it for yourself and know that it is happening and then recognize it taking place out there. Literally, like we're, like right now, you guys and the few people on my YouTube channel are the only people who talk about average inflation rate. <laughs> <laughs> I'm serious. Yeah. What was the other? Uh, the other question was, are you familiar with um, the dollar milkshake theory? Yeah. So with Brett Johnson? What's yeah. your opinion on that? Um, I love Brent Johnson's dollar milkshake theory. Anybody familiar with that? <laughs> yeah, all nighters. All right. Here's something that I don't know if a lot of people realize. There are debts that are due in dollars that are outside of the United States, right? Don't have anything to do with our government, doesn't have anything to do with our banking system, doesn't have anything to do with our people, our investors, our corporations, nothing doesn't have anything to do with the United States, but yet these contracts are written and due in dollars. So now this creates a demand for dollars that's outside of the United States, right? A good example of this is even just recently, I did some research on the BRICS nations. So I typed in Brazil, US dollar denominated debt. You realize they just sold a shitload of debt that's due in dollars for the next 10 years? Like where's Brazil gonna get this dollars from unless they sell their products in dollars, right? Or they borrow more dollars into the future. Somehow they have to get a hold of dollars in order to pay those debts back. 
Is there going to be a demand for dollars outside of the United States? Damn right there is if they have these debts that are going on. Here's what's the scariest scenario behind this, right? Is that these debts, these contracts that are written in dollars, that are due in dollars, that are written outside of the United States, get used like dollars. Like literally get used like a dollar. They're not a dollar. It's a contract for a dollar, but it's getting used as a dollar. So you think about how many transactions are occurring around the world in dollars that aren't even dollars. They're contracts for dollars. All of a sudden, all these contracts need to come due. They're not going to roll them over into new, into new debts. Well, what happens? These people need to get hold of the dollars to pay these debts off. As soon as they pay the debts off, boom, dollars disappear. How much demand for dollars is going to take place when this scenario starts to happen? Right? Can the Fed even print at a pace that is fast enough to cover all these dollar-dominated debts that exist outside the world? I wonder. You know? Thank you. Um, do you see inter mortgage interest rates being lowered any time? And if so, when? Uh, mortgage rates going lower. Um, like, not in the near future, no. I don't. Um, you know, one of the things, like, one of the things that kind of occurred to me when I was looking at the interest rates moving up, like, when the Federal Reserve made that first initial move, you remember that? It was three quarters of a point. Does anybody remember what happened to mortgages right after that? The Fed moves three quarters of a percentage point. Like, it was a lot. A few weeks later, mortgages were at 8%. Right? Then what happened? They stalled out, right? No, they didn't stall out. They fluctuated, right? Around eight to six, whatever, eight to seven. But they didn't keep in lockstep with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve kept moving interest rates up. Mortgages were flat, right? So it made me wonder, what's going on here? Why is it that these mortgages aren't keeping in lockstep with the Federal Reserve's interest rates? Like, why is this like this disconnect? And then I got to thinking about it a little bit, and I was realizing, ah, you know, this is about the mortgage-backed security market itself, like the pool of mortgage-backed securities that are out there, okay? You think about it. A mortgage-backed security is a bunch of mortgages that get piled into a box, right, and get sold off to an investor. Simple way to explain it. The Federal Reserve bought a lot of these things, and they were going to roll these things off of their balance sheet. So if you can imagine all of a sudden these mortgage-backed securities hitting the market, there's going to be a flood of them, right? Well, just like any supply and demand, if you have a huge supply of them, what happens to the price, right? Falls. Mortgage-backed securities are just like any bond, right? Bond prices fall, yields rise, expensive mortgages, right? So this was kind of the idea that was coming from the Federal Reserve, or at least the idea from the Federal Reserve unwinding their balance sheet, allowing those mortgages to roll off. But then what happened? Right? Less refinancing and less home sales. So now the issuance of new mortgage-backed securities coming onto the market has dropped dramatically. So the pool of mortgage-backed securities for the investors to buy is somewhat limited, and it's found its mark. This is where the investor says, yes, that's my price. I'm good with that. The yield is appropriate. And now this is as far as the yields can go because it would have kept going with the lockstep with the Federal Reserve had it been anything else. Yeah, so I would keep an eye on the mortgage-backed security market myself, and I think that would be telling of where interest rates are going to go. And I'm not real familiar with the mortgage-backed security market, but I imagine there's some YouTubers out there who are. <laughs> yep. How are you doing? Uh, so, doing well. Thank you. Um, so one thought and then uh, two questions. So as a um, veteran, this one will help kind of um, – show where this one's going. So I uh, think as you're talking about the credible threat, mm -hmm. I see that as a little bit um, disingenuous or manipulative, um, thinking about uh, how the structure of the VA loan works because of that you know, guarantee. And so when the Fed kind of uh, mirroring, saying, hey, we'll back this, you know, whatever it may be, like it, it gives um, you know, investors, it gives the market that, you know, reassurance that, hey, we already see something um, similar that's already in effect, you know, why wouldn't we believe the Fed? So that's kind of just the thought that uh, crossed my mind about that. Um, um, and then the, the questions that I had, um, one about the Cantian effect, and then one that I guess is kind of outside of everything that we talked about, 
Um, so examples of the Cantillon effect. So are we seeing things like that with like the uh, annual appropriations with um, like for example the, the um, DOD budget or like more recent examples with um, uh, the rounds of stimulus that we've seen. Are, are those like examples? Um, I would assume that yes, what you're, what you're saying, especially when it comes to the stimulus part of things. I would very much think that that is the efforts from the government to try and deal with the effects of the Cantillon, right? From the Cantillon effects. Government is reactive. They're not the ones who are causing anything to happen, right? So ultimately, if the economy wasn't in the condition that it is, then the, then the government wouldn't be doing the things that they do, right? If you have issues with trade imbalances and they start doing tariffs, it's because of the issues with the economy, right? It didn't, it didn't create the issues. They're trying to deal with them. So those natural economic forces that are occurring out there, they're probably going to be persistent no matter what. Now, they will change because we have different conditions, we have government interactions and stuff like that. If we were to follow this Cantillon effect and think about it like the way it really is going where the new money comes in and you know continues to pour into luxuries and separates the classes, how does that new money come into the system? That's what we, what we have to think about, right? So now we do this new money by the debt issuance, right? So we sell debt to the around the world, U.S. Treasuries. There's a demand for U.S. Treasuries because people want that safe and liquid asset, right? I don't know why they think it's safe and liquid, but it is, and that's the one that everybody has chosen, and it just seems to be that way. So I'm not trying to defend that part of it, but that's what is it's out. That's what's out there. So now, how do we get this new money into the system? This is really where the Cantillon effect starts to like. How does this happen? To me, I think about it in that form of like UBI. You hear so much about UBI and MMT. You guys familiar with I was, that? I was right? about to say MMT, universal yeah. basic income. All right, modern monetary theory, the idea that they can like literally issue checks out to us and we get to spend that and at whatever we want, right? So now, what is it that's happening there with this UBI? Like people are like, oh no, this is a benefit, this is a great thing for the American people and the people who are poor and all this other stuff and they sell it as this idea, but really, what are they trying to do? America doesn't produce anything, remember that. Like they do, but they don't produce, they really don't, right? What do we produce? We produce a consumer. That's what UBI is doing. It's producing a consumer, right? And that way the new money can continue to flow into the system. So long as we're buying the production of other nations, they're buying our debt, right? Until that falls, then this, like the weird things that happen within the nation, that's gonna continue to happen. And I mean, it can only be your wild guess on what those things look like. But this is the reason why it's happening. Go ahead. And then um, a second question. Sure. Um, this one's gonna be like a little bit I guess further afield, um, talking about uh, China, like present with everything that's going on presently. So there's actual deflation that's going on, and I know that's something that um, I've sent Zuber, you know, at least a handful of articles about. Like there's like negative yeah. um, GDP. Um, could you talk about? I guess this is kind of two parter. So one about how long. Uh, deflation goes from being like a sort of okay thing to like a really, really, really bad thing really quickly. Um, and what I'm thinking and kind of had in mind is like, you know, up to about like maybe, you know, somewhere between three to six months, like, okay, that's generally good for the consumer. But beyond that, then it starts to kind of kick in that mindset of like, oh, okay, well, we're gonna expect to continue to see prices drop after that sort of six month time frame. So I guess that was part one. And then um, part two, I guess more broadly, of course, looking at to um, the property market broadly in um, China, um, I guess a little bit further, like, so I'll just say the question is, could China potentially be on the precipice of a lost decade? Just looking at like the amount of just mess that's going on broadly. Okay. Um, I got so into the second question, I forgot the first one already. Um. <laughs> oh. So I guess the first one is just more, um, uh, do you think it's, um, when, I guess, would you say, you know, deflation, deflation goes from and how being, long? Yeah. Goes, okay. Um, I think the first part of that question actually was how bad or good or whatever it comes down to. This, yeah. is, this is a really kind of a personal question on how you have positioned yourself, right? Because if you're in the position in which that you have a lot of debt and you're trying to like 
find inflation in the future to make that debt less, you know, kind of idea, then that's the position that you have taken. Now, somebody else might be sitting on a ton of cash waiting for a deflationary scenario. You guys are looking at it two different ways. So is it a good or bad thing? It isn't. It's just an is, right? It's how you positioned yourself to deal with it as it comes. So as far as like a bad thing, I don't look at like, I don't look at the economy as a good or bad thing, like in any way. And even when, you know, there's crisis situations happening, it's just more of an event that's happening that you have to deal with that's going to be there. And although it's very shocking and damaging to a lot of people, it's not, to me, it's not a good or a bad thing. It's just a thing that's happening. It's like the weather, you know, almost. And so when I look at it that way and I think about like, you know, whether or not it's a good or bad thing, Generally speaking, I would assume for investment purposes and growth and business and all that other stuff that the 2% target inflation rate is probably better than a deflationary one. But I'm a saver too, so I'm cool. I can go with deflation too. Like I'm good with that. You know, like I'll find, you know, assets and stuff that I can buy for cheaper on the dollar if I happen to be in that situation. So I'm not looking at it as like a good or bad thing. Moving into China, this is a really interesting one, right? Because China's running into a deflationary scenario. How do you stop it from happening? Like the United States can do something about it. We can print up as much money as we want, do whatever the hell we want, right? But China doesn't have that same luxury. See, like they could go up and print a bunch of debt, but are you really gonna buy you a Chinese debt? Hell no, nobody's gonna buy it. Any people who are gonna buy it is China, right? And so they can't really like issue out debt to try and get that new money back into their, into their system. They were getting new money through production, very much like the United States was doing back in the 50s, 60s, whatever. China's doing that, right? They were the manufacturer of the world. Well, what happens when your standard of living rises, like it did in China, right? All of a sudden, now manufacturing is finding its way to Mexico, to Malaysia, to Vietnam, to wherever else, right? So this is the Cantillon effect hitting China. Well, now China's going to do something about that. What? Right? This is the scary part. What are they going to do? Are they just going to sit there and go, oh, crap, well, I guess we're over. See you guys. No, right? They ain't going to do that. They're going to fight, and that's scary. This is where world wars and shit like that start up, right? There is one other little piece that may prevent that from actually being the end result of it, and that is, is that China has done something with the Belt and Road Initiative. Have you guys heard of this? Right? They went around the world, and they did infrastructure projects in all these different nations out there. Very interesting thing that they did when they did all these infrastructure projects, right? They lent money to all these nations to build a port, to build a power plant, to build a coal mine. They did this in dollars, U.S. dollars. If the dollar was to strengthen, what you would end up finding is that these nations will have very difficult time trying to pay those debts back. If they can't pay them back, who owns them? There you go. Right? So this might be the way China gets that new money to come into the system, even though they're not the manufacturers anymore. But if it doesn't work, what are they going to do? They're going to fight. You know, that's because they don't have any other choice. I appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah, you bet, man. Thank nice. you. Hey, Simon, I appreciate you and what you do. Thank you. Um, it looks sometimes right now that the, uh, the Treasury and the government is trying to inflate the economy. Um, you know, for the political reasons, and you have the Fed trying to tamp down the economy. Um, do you see um, a little fight going on between sort of the government and the Fed? And in that battle, who do you think wins? I don't. I don't see a battle taking place there. You see, I think this is a coordinated together. effort between the two of them. Okay. I mean, now. I'm not one who's really that political, so I'm not really politically minded to say that this is an administration thing or anything like that. I mean, there was a time in my life that I was incredibly politically minded. I knew every congressman name, I knew the bills, I knew everything that was going on. And when the Republican Party blackballed Ron Paul out of it, out of the debates, out of all that other stuff, I basically gave him the finger and said, I'm not trusting you guys anymore. So I just don't care about politics as much as I did. And I found that the more I study into economics and look at these economic forces, those guys are interacting with the economy. We are the economy. It's our choices that we make. It's the things that we do. It's the businesses, the investments. If you're 80 years old or if you're 18 years old, the decisions that you make are going to be so different, right? 
But this is, the, this is the real economy. It's the choices that we make for ourselves. The Federal Reserve is not an organization that is a benefit to the United States, right? What it did is it created an elastic money supply to try and smooth out the business cycles. It did okay at that, but then it created these debt cycles. Which one's better, right? So ultimately, it's our problem and our decisions and our basically ultimate, you know, choice to make these decisions for ourselves and to not fall victim to the ideas that are coming from the mainstream media or the Fed or all these other people out there. Internalizing this stuff for yourselves, all of a sudden the world ain't so scary anymore. Scary things like, the, you know, the new world order coming to get you and stuff like that, it's, it's not, not as important anymore. Right? That stuff exists when you're confused and you're lost and you just don't know what's happening. Well, how is that for day one? Nailed it! I like that. <laughs> so first and foremost, I want to shout out everybody on the virtual broadcast. Yes, folks, people have been sitting for eight hours in their home. I'm looking at the, the camera right there. Your night is over. You can go. We are shut down the Zoom. We will see you bright and early tomorrow, 8 a.m. We'll probably start the Zoom at 7.50. Virtual, you're out. Shut it down. They're gone. Woo! Now for the folks. Actually, let's do this. We got to give you your championship belt. There you go. I bet you don't have one of those. You're the man. Thank you very much. It's going to be hard to hang that from the, uh, the visor in your car. It's a little heavy. <laughs> Replace the dice. Thank you so much. You got it, Simon. I appreciate your family.